Thank you, everyone, for your patience as we get going this morning. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sarah Swanbeck. I am the executive director of the Berkeley Institute for the Future of Young Americans. It's a relatively new center at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley. Um, we are primarily interested in things like whether or not we are making adequate investment in the next generation of young people. Um, and to that end, a lot of the topics on our agenda today are, are pretty relevant for us. Um, so um, I'll say a little bit more about the, uh, the Berkeley Institute for the Future of Young Americans uh, on the next panel. Um, but for now, uh, just a few logistical things. You should have Wi-Fi passwords uh, on your tables if you need that. Uh, the restrooms are just down the hall here. And uh, we are recording this morning, um, and so the uh, video will be available following presentations in case you want to circle back and just relive this whole thing. Um, and also for those uh, panelists that are okay with it, we will be posting their PowerPoints uh, following this in case you also want to follow up with them. So I'm pretty excited about the panels that we have lined up today. Um, uh, I think we're going to touch on some interesting and relevant things. Uh, an issue that I think first is something that is uh, somewhat unique to California, and that's the issue of revenue volatility. Uh, uh, and looking at that issue in terms of the difficulty the state has had over time, uh, kind of balancing its budget and some of the unpredictability that the, that volatility has brought into that process. Uh, and then the second panel, uh, we're going to touch on an issue that is not at all unique to California, uh, and that is uh, the state's ongoing uh, unfunded pension liabilities. Um, and this is an area in which uh, the institute uh, that I had at Berkeley is particularly interested in uh, we're interested in getting more young people to sort of understand the complexities of what's going on uh, in this world and the degree to which that affects um, funding of other programs that affect them. Um, I think it's also a particularly interesting time to be having some of these conversations. We have major tax reform happening at the federal level, uh, which I think is adding even more uncertainty um, into some of these processes. Uh, and then we have a governor who's on his way out and um, when he introduced his budget about a month ago, you know, it was a little bit doom and gloom in terms of what's to come for the state. Um, and so I think from my perspective, uh, being concerned about this next generation of Californians, um, if I were watching his state of the state, I might be a little bit concerned too. Um, so we're going to touch on both of those issues today, but we're also going to lead off with a panel with um, my co-sponsor for the day, the Volcker Alliance. Um, we have been contributing to a research project with them looking at transparency and state budgeting. Um, I will go ahead and introduce uh, Bill Glasgow, who's here. Um, he's going to lead things off. Uh, he is the Senior Vice President and the Director of State and Local Initiatives for the Volcker Alliance. Um, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about some of the research that we've been doing with him. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everybody, and welcome, welcome folks watching on the live stream. I greatly appreciate uh, your coming here. Thank you, Noah, for, for helping me with the slides. So we're looking at uh, truth and integrity in state budgeting. That's the, the, that's the name of the project. Truth and integrity are qualities that are a bit in short supply uh, and a bit, of a, a bit of an oxymoron, perhaps. And, and this, is, this is the case nationally. Uh, we're going to explain a little bit about how we look at budgets what the Volcker Alliance uh, is, and uh, some, some unique issues, um, or almost unique issues for, for the state of California. Uh, so what are our objectives here? Um, we started this project uh, almost four years ago when I, when I joined the Alliance from Bloomberg, uh, and we started with, with several goals in mind. One is um, identify the five, five key budgeting processes or procedures that we can that we can measure. Uh, it's very hard to compare state against state. It's very hard to compare, even harder to compare city against city, because every state does does things differently. Uh, and but they're 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 common procedures. So we're looking at the procedures. We we wanted to grade the state's performance in each area. We're not doing a zero to zero to fifty best state on all counts and worst state on all counts. Uh, instead, we're looking at uh, we're looking at how they do in the key in, in the key metrics. Um, you can draw your own conclusions, and I'll and I'll speak to that in a second. Uh, we're proposing best practices for states to follow. 
We're continuing these evaluations annually, God willing, uh, with our network of universities. Uh, one of our goals at the Volcker Alliance is to bolster the teaching of public administration, public finance, and uh, public budgeting. Uh, and that's uh, certainly, we're certainly meeting that goal. And we also want to encourage f further university-based research um, based partly on our, on our research and findings, and we'll discuss that in a second. So this is the Volcker Alliance Research Network. The Volcker Alliance was set up in 2013 by Paul Volcker, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve. His goal, he's, he's really a lifelong civil servant and the son of a civil servant. His goal is to improve the effectiveness of management of government. So it's a, it's a lofty goal uh, and it's, it's one where you can, you can define it in many ways. So we're looking at it from the state government perspective. We're the, uh, we're the successor to something called the State Budget Crisis Task Force that uh, Paul Volcker and Dick Ravitch, the former Lieutenant Governor of New York, uh, ran just after the recession for several years, looking at at some of the larger states and how they how they have been coping with budget, budget stresses. So we set up a network. Uh, we set up a network of, of eleven universities. You can see on the on the, the handout. I won't go through them now. Um, let me go back here for a second. Uh, but we have a network of eleven universities. Um, that network looked at about 30 common questions about budget procedures. And from that, we derived, uh, we derived scores and grades. Uh, this has also led to uh, some follow-up research in the area of debt management, tax expenditure, transparency, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, replacement cost, uh, transparency and, and practices, uh, economic health, and God willing, a, a project on city budgeting as well. Um, this will also also lead to truth and integrity in state budgeting phase two. Uh, we expect to have our, our data together in a few months and a report later this year. And God willing, then phase three will, will, will follow. Uh, so before I go to the, the, the findings, let me just go through some of the, the, the state physical framework. Uh, some of you are very familiar with this. Gabe uh, Pettick, who will be on the panel later, certainly is. Uh, it's, it's not all that great, even though, even though we're in the third longest economic recovery since 1858 when records began. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at GDP growth in the, in the almost 3% to a little over 2% range over the next couple of years. Um, maybe a little more inflation, uh, a little higher bond rates, uh, low unemployment. Uh, it's it's tough not to find a job right now if you're uh, if you're if you're if you're looking. Um, rising deficits and in interest rates uh, partly as a result of the federal tax bill. Uh, slow state revenue growth. This predates the tax bill, but state revenue is growing uh, just a little bit a little bit more than inflation, or just around the inflation rate, three to three and a half percent. That doesn't allow for a lot of fat in your in your spending. Um, Revenues to GDP. Uh, I'll show you a chart about that in a second. But revenues to GDP, uh, they're running at, at, at the same level as they were in 2005. Uh, state revenues to GDP is about 10 percent. 25 states reported budget shortfalls in, in, in 2018. Um, that's down from 25. We're having an economic recovery, but uh, it's, it's down from 25 or 31, I should say, last year. But you know, 18, 18 states is, is a lot. Um, state spending growth is modest. States have to have balanced budgets, and they're they're keeping they're keeping their spending growth down. Uh, that uh, that is leading to a lot of potholes uh, and perhaps a lot of a lot of crowded classrooms. Uh, so we're not seeing a boom in state spending, even though we're having a pretty good recovery. Uh, and then we have some budget pressure points. Um, salt. Uh, the loss of the SALT deduction in the federal tax bill is, is certainly one. Um, pensions and OPEB, of course, Medicaid, uh, infrastructure, K through 12, all the things that states provide are under, are being squeezed. And uh, states are not going to be borrowing their way out of trouble. States generally don't borrow to cover deficits, and when they do, uh, there's a certain amount of opprobrium attached. But even for infrastructure, uh, State uh, municipal bond issuance in general will be around 
300 billion this year. It's a 4.3 trillion dollar market. So we're this is this has been down, down, down. It's uh, it, it's debt is a bad word, and taking on the taking on the extra expense of debt service is a bad word. So states are reluctant to invest in uh, in their economic future. So put this in, in a in a little graphic. State fiscal stresses. That blue line up at the top. That's that's the one thing that's growing like crazy. That's Medicaid's share of state spending. Not, not the federal share, just the Medicaid share. Medicaid was expanded under Obamacare. Um, these numbers are a couple years old, but it's, it, it, it's the pattern, really. So Medicaid is, is about a little over 2.5% of, of, of US GDP, Medicaid state spending. Every other category of state spending is flat. Uh, and within those, within those categories, an increasing portion is going for pensions, employee health care, retiree health care. So everything is getting squeezed. We don't really have an answer for that. Um, another way to look at it is this is this is from uh, Dan White at Moody's, uh, Moody's at, at Moody's Analytics with full credit. Uh, social benefits to persons, uh, state and local mandatory spending as a percentage of total is widening out. Uh, this is a real concern for a state like California. New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, that rely a lot on capital gains for their tax, for their tax revenue. Uh, you've got a mismatch of very volatile revenue and very high and growing fixed expenditures. I don't know what the answer is, but what we're trying to do in our project is expose how the states are coping with this, some well, some not so well. So what are our best practices? Budget forecasting. Uh, we think a consensus a consensus approach to revenue forecasting, which California does not use, uh, is the way to go. Uh, in Utah and Pennsylvania, bills have been dropped in the past couple months based on our recommendations. Uh, it's it it gets a number out there that's harder to argue about, and one that's one that's important. Budget accounting. We we think that in an ideal world, states would use accrual accounting like New York City does for their budgets as well as their financial reports. They don't. Uh, they, they don't, and they probably won't, but we're still going to push it. Uh, the idea is pay for expenditures in the same year that they're incurred. Uh, legacy costs. All we're asking is that the states make consistently make their contributions, their actuarial contributions, to pensions and OPEB, which is basically uh, retiree health care. Some states do. Many states don't. Uh, we did in California for not doing it one year. Uh, but it's a, it's a big issue uh, because when you don't make your full contribution, you're creating debt. It's, it's a form of uh, voter unauthorized general obligation debt. It's not clear how this will come out, but you keep building it up and building it up and building it up on the side, and all of a sudden it becomes a big issue. Um, fiscal reserve funds. It's great for states and cities, for that matter, to have rainy day funds, but they need policies to, to guide how is the money put in? How is the money taken out? And what kind of rules are there to make sure that, to, to make sure that the procedures are followed? States that don't follow these, these rules, we, we've downgraded. Uh, and transparency. Um, every state should have a consolidated budget website. Uh, most do, fortunately. Uh, every state should also inclu include full disclosure of the cost to replace depreciated infrastructure. Only two states do that, California and Alaska. Um, we were proposing, a, we actually have a, a project going to look further into this, why states don't make this disclosure. It's very important because it's another form of debt that's building up off balance sheet. So the grades, we graded all 50 states. Uh, you can see in the back of the room, take home with you our new state budget report cards. These are like stock reports for states. They don't say buy, sell, or hold. But they tell you on the front a little story about why we graded the states the way we did, what the grades are relative to other states in the, in the region, and then a bunch of quant stuff in the back in, with pretty pictures. So it's easy to understand and, uh, and useful to take around. So who did what? California actually got three A's out of five categories, which is, which is quite good. It's one of the better performing states, um, although it did, it did much less well in some areas, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, budget maneuvers, uh, the one-time actions that states use. 22 states got an A, so uh, 
that says that about half the states are actually are actually running a pretty clean shop, and we and, and we like that. We'll see if that if that continues. If there's another recession, legacy costs only eight states were graded A. Um, states have a big problem. Cities have a big problem in dealing with these legacy costs. Reserve funds, um, only 15 states got the top grade. 35 states have room to improve. Uh, and the 15 states with A's have room to teach, uh, teach other states what to do. Transparency, two states, Alaska and California, got an A because of the infrastructure issue. Uh, some states are very good about disclosing a lot of things, but infrastructure is not one of them. Uh, the worst graded states, let's look at legacy costs for a second. That should really be at the top. 34 states got a C or worse. So that tells you only 16 states are, are making their full commitments. And it's a, it's, a, it's a burden and it's a cost. But 34 states have a lot of room to improve. Um, three states got a D in transparency, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, and New Mexico. Um, in budget maneuvers, six states got a D. Again, that, that tells you that there's, there are six states that have a lot of room to improve. And in forecasting, four states got a, got a D. Uh, before I get to California, just it's, it's curious. The, the states with the most A grades uh, were uh, California, Hawaii, Idaho, and Utah. The, the states with the, most, uh, with the most D or D minus grades. D minus is our worst. We decided there's no such thing as a failed state. Um, you know, the cop cars are on the road. Uh, the, 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 the health department continues to inspect. The taxes get collected, even in the worst states. Uh, Stuff, stuff still gets done at, at, at some level. But uh, the most ease, this is hardly surprising, would be Illinois, Kansas, and New Jersey. Um, Connecticut is a, is a, it comes up close behind. I think Connecticut did better in our survey just, just because of the, the lag in the data. Uh, but Connecticut is a rapidly worsening situation, as is Pennsylvania, that's, that has a great deal of difficulty uh, not, only, not only passing a balanced budget, but funding one. Uh, so that's, that's another trouble spot to watch. California versus the Pacific states. You can see this on your, on your report cards. Uh, and for those of you watching the live stream, uh, just tune in to our website, uh, volkeralliance.org, V-O-L-C-K-E-R, alliance.org. It's all up there, and all the report cards are downloadable singly or in the, the whole bunch. But California, you know, did, did okay in budget forecasting. California does not use consensus forecasting. Um, adults may differ about, about whether the state should or should not, but this is, this is the criteria we used. Uh, budget maneuvers, California ran a, a clean, a pretty clean shop over three, the, the three years we studied, 2015, 16, and 17. Legacy costs, California got dinged for not making a, an actuarial pension contribution uh, in one of the three years we studied. Uh, that was the result of an accounting change, but it, it is what it is. Uh, reserve funds, California has got uh, voter passed rules. Governor Brown and his new budget is putting more money into reserves. Uh, we think that's a good thing because there's not only cash, but there's rules for the cash and transparency. Uh, we think California is, is one of, the, uh, one of the, the best states in terms of disclosure in the budget. Uh, so that's, and that was the story. Um, I'm not going to go through all the, the text of this, uh, but in general, California, uh, it, it runs a, a very good budget by our, by our estimation, but, but has room to improve. Um, you'll see when you get into the quant areas where we, where we ding the state, uh, one was in consensus revenue forecasting, as I mentioned, one was in... Um, one was in revenue and cost shifting, which involves, uh, among other things, shifting expenditures down to the state or local, down to the local or county level uh, in order to balance the budget. Um, OPEB and pension funding remains a big issue, as Chuck Reed will talk about later. Um, and the rest, is, the rest is pretty good. Um, in 2015, uh, we noticed that re the reserves were not tied to revenue volatility. We think that, that reserves, part of the rules for reserves, should, should include consideration of how volatile the revenue are. It's one thing to say, well, we're going to put 5% of, or 6% or 8% of revenues into the, into the re rainy day fund. Um, but if you're, 
if your revenues are wildly gyrating, maybe that's not enough, maybe that's too much. We don't know. So that's an area that needs to be studied further. Um, I want to just spend like a, just a, a few short seconds uh, on disclosure and the, and the new tax law. Because I think the new federal tax law is going to have profound implications for all of the states, uh, and especially California. California is one of the five, uh, one of the five states with a, a negative balance of payments. Uh, they, they send more to Washington than they get back. And we don't know exactly how the loss of the state and local tax deduction will, will affect taxpayers and behavior and state revenues. It's something to watch. Um, what the, what the, the, the lack of salt does is it, it may curb support for tax increases at the local level or at the county level. That's the case certainly where I live in New Jersey. Um, some states may come out ahead in tax reform. Um, the, the, the important thing to, to note here, though, is that uh, states are going to have to states are going to have to open up their tax codes because uh, state tax codes mirror the federal tax code very closely. Um, as it is, we surveyed for tax expenditures, uh, which are both corporate uh, corporate job to job incentives, as well as the big things like sales tax exemptions, senior citizen tax exemptions. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these, may be modeled on on uh, federal federal policy. When the states open up their tax codes, there's an opportunity, maybe an opportunity to cut taxes. There also may be an opportunity to broaden the tax base. We don't know what the behavior is going to be, what the workarounds uh, states uh, states try may be. But when we looked at states, there's, uh, there's 11, about 11 states that really don't seem to know what they give away every year in tax expenditures, which, which is troubling. And there are some states that just do a very cursory disclosure of this. Uh, we, think, we think states could do better. Now, California is one of the states that publishes something called the Tax Expenditure Report. How many of you have seen this document? OK, so that's. These are, these are all smart people in the room, and, and I've got about three hands. Three hands went up. I, I had dinner with a with a former state house reporter last night, a friend of mine, and I said, "Do you ever you ever look at this, this document?" He said, "No, I never heard of it." And I said, "Well, you know, have a look at it because California gives away. California foregoes rather than gives away. California foregoes sixty one point four billion dollars of revenue. Uh, this was in twenty seventeen eighteen. That's almost what half the budget." Equivalent. So these are sales tax, sales tax breaks on foods, um, the things that the things that mirror the federal law, uh, property tax exemptions, dependent exemptions, home mortgages, capital gains on sale of residence, R and D credits, so on and so on and so on. Um, it's really time for all the states to think about how much revenue they forego uh, and whether. Whether each of these each of these provisions that lead to the 61, 61 billion dollar number, whether each of these provisions are following the laws that that authorize them in the first place, are they accomplishing a, a, a revenue goal, a social policy goal, a finance goal? Uh, if the goal of, of tax exemptions is to help poorer people, are tax credits a better way, a more efficient way? Nobody ever monitors these things. Uh, I tell a story about uh, New Jersey, which in New Jersey, we, uh, we exempt toilet paper, paper towels, household paper products from sales taxes. When um, it's not clear whether this is to help, uh, help poorer consumers or to help the paper, the paper companies that, that operate in New Jersey or the grocery retailers. I, I have no idea because the, the, the origins of this exemption are buried in time. When Governor Florio in the 1980s tried to uh, repeal that exemption, uh, people marched on the state house un unfurling rolls of toilet paper. Uh, and it was the end, it was the beginning of the end of, of his first term. Uh, it, you know, people like it, but nobody knows why and what it's, what it's accomplishing. Uh, this costs the state nine, $90 million a year. It's, it's, a, it's a fair number. But uh, all told, uh, the sales tax exemption on food and clothing in New Jersey costs a billion dollars a year. A billion dollars out of a thirty-odd billion dollar budget is a, it's a significant number. So we have to think about these, especially now that we have an opportunity to revisit all of these tax codes. Um, finally, the, the budget challenge. Uh, 
it's a little wordy, but you know, establishing and maintaining strong and transparent budget practices, uh, that's a concern for the entire US economy. We are, we are an economy of states. Uh, but the best practices can't be, uh, they, they can't bolster fiscal stability and good informed policy making uh, without the political will to adapt and, and to adopt and adapt and supply them for the, uh, support them for the long term. And that's the really question. There's a, there's a political question here. Uh, everybody wants to have balanced budgets. Nobody wants to really admit that the way they often balance budgets is by pushing stuff off to the future, pushing stuff off to the side, and that's what we're trying to look for and, uh, and, and really support more research on. Uh, so that's my little spiel, and we're, we're welcome to have uh, any questions you have in the audience for me or, or for Sarah. And, and thank you so much, Sarah, for, for your support and, uh, and participation in this. It's, it's a real pleasure. Yes. Are you going to do some Q&A first? Oh, OK. Well, yeah. You're up front. And, and if, if you have a question, wait for, wait for the mic to come by. Hi there. I work for a local government. And we similarly have concerns about CalPERS, our pension costs increasing. And I'm curious what you think about ideas to um, set up portable 401ks for employees. Um, I guess this is something that's done maybe at the federal level? Well, Chuck may have, uh, in, in, the, in the, the session on pensions later, Chuck, Chuck may have some, some thoughts on that. Uh, this, this, some states have moved to a, a system where they've frozen the existing pension system and set up 401ks. Um, you know, in theory, that's, a, that, that, that's great. Uh, but the devil is in the details. So when Michigan, when Michigan did this, they didn't adequately fund the frozen pension system. And so all of a sudden, Michigan found itself having a new pension crisis. Utah was more successful in this. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's, it can be done, um, but it's, you know, it, it, needs to, it, it needs to be done properly. The, the, the second point is uh, that 401ks are not necessarily uh, cheaper and may actually be more expensive than, uh, than defined benefit plans uh, because you're running a lot of smaller accounts. So I think the 401k industry needs to become more, more sophisticated in terms of shaving costs. Uh, and so the costs don't go to the, don't go to the, uh, the bankers, the brokers, the, all the, the record keepers, all the different people who have, who have hands in the pie. Um, the portability is wonderful, and that's that's really one of the issues of uh, that government pensions have today is that younger workers would like to move around. If, if I'm uh, if I'm in the CalSTRS system, I can I can move around jobs in California. It's a big, it's, you know, it's the eighth largest economy in the world, so you you can move around a lot. If I'm in the if I'm in the pension system in Rhode Island. Uh, my, and, I, and I want to find a teaching job somewhere else. You know, my, my, I'm limited, and the market's limited, and my pension won't travel with me. So it, it would be nice to see a more portable retirement system like, like we have in private industry. Uh, and, and they have to be mandatory. They have to be, you know, like a mandatory contribution system uh, or an opt-out system because Given the choice, people don't contribute to, to 401ks. The average, the average balances are really, you know, they're in the $100,000 range or less, depending on whose stats you use. Any more questions? Oh, sorry, Gabe. How many dates do you... Wait for the, wait for the mic, because we're, we're live. I was just curious about the partnerships you have with other states. How many, um, like with the Goldman School, how, how many do you have around the country that are analogous? Uh, we, phase one, uh, it, it, we worked with 11, 11 schools, um, all of them public universities. Uh, I'll, I'll try and count them off my figures. I might, I might get to 12. <laughs> I might get to 12, but let's, let's, let's see if I can, I, let, let's see if you test me on this. Um, here in California, it, it's Berkeley, University of Utah, uh, Arizona State worked with us on, on phase one. Uh, 
the University of three different uh, three different University of Illinois uh, institutions: uh, Illinois Springfield, Illinois Chicago, and IGPA, which is on the Illinois uh, Illinois Chicago campus. Uh, Cornell, CUNY in New York, Georgia State, Kentucky, and Florida International, and Minnesota. And Minnesota. See. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I got about 90 on that. That wasn't bad. Chuck. Bill, uh, Chuck Reed. I'm going to talk later about pensions, but one of the big problems in getting states to deal with their pension problems uh, are the cash basis budgets that states love because it's the easiest way to hide your obligations, and there's really nothing you can't cover up if you don't you know, want to disclose it with a cash basis budget. So... I see states are reluctant to move away from that approach. Are you seeing any trends based on your work that states are realizing that cash-based budget is hiding a lot of stuff and that they ought to do something better in terms of their disclosures? And is, are they moving to gap or some variation? Nope. <laughs> there's one government, there's one major government unit in the entire United States that uses a form of gap or accrual accounting for its budget, and that's New York City. Uh, New York City was uh, was forced to do that as the price of a bailout, and uh, it was enshrined. It was enshrined uh, by the city council and then by referendum. So it's 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 deeply it's deeply rooted in in New York culture now. Uh, New York hasn't had a financial crisis since 1975, uh, when it was nine minutes away from filing for for Chapter Nine. And New York also lives under the threat that if it, uh, if it doesn't follow the, the rules of, of accrual in its budgeting, that a control board can be reconvened and reimposed on the city. Uh, nobody's figured out yet um, a set of incentives and, and controls for the states. Uh, there's some people like Dick Ravitch think that the states could, could uh, Waive sovereignty for a lot of things, including including filing for Chapter Nine bankruptcy. Uh, you have you have uh, Puerto Rico's special bankruptcy, but that was under the that was uh, created under the Territories Clause of the Constitution, uh, and proved that Puerto Rico is, is not as sovereign as a state. So I don't I haven't seen any movement in in that area. Um, you know, if you look at what Connecticut uh, did with its recently with its. Uh, with its pension obligations, it pushed uh, it pushed its uh, 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 amortization schedule out 16 years to 2048. It's essentially on an open schedule. It's kind of like what Kansas has done several times and Illinois has done. So, given the opportunity, uh, given the opportunity to, to, to kick the can, you take the can and you kick it. And uh, it's it's hard to get it's hard to get voters uh, riled up about that. But that's. I, I see it's becoming an issue for the rating agencies um, because they're now looking at debt holistically rather than just bond debt and uh, bond debt, bank debt. Now they're looking at pension debt, and I'm, I'm fairly passionate about that. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that states are reluctant to incur debt, uh, but they're not reluctant to incur pension debt, it seems. And could you just talk a little bit about the difference between bonded debt and pension debt, or the debt they don't want to accrue versus the debt that doesn't really matter if they accrue? Sure. Uh, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to incur um, an unfunded liability because uh, you don't have to. You don't have. To, you generally, you don't have to put it up to a referendum when when various states pushed off their, their amortization or just ignored, ignored amortization schedules that they had, they didn't have to put that in front of the voters. If, if California wants to sell a general obligation bond, it has to, it has to get on the ballot. As, as you know uh, from your own experience, Chuck, getting on the ballot is not a sure thing in California. So it's, you know, it's a big deal. And likewise, school bonds and sewer bonds and you know, er, bonds are generally something that are voted on. Um, Stretching out the pension is not voted on, uh, so it's it's e it's easier to incur that debt, and it it's also it's a soft debt. You can you it's very difficult to restructure a general obligation bond. You can refund it uh, less now under the under the new tax law. You can call bonds when, when if you if you issue bonds that that can be 
called back after 10 years or a certain period. It's there in writing. You agree with the investors. The investors buy in. You know, they, they, they buy into that. Pensions uh, can be restructured at you know, any old time uh, by, by contract or, le or legislative action. Any, any more questions? I'll go. So um, I uh, am going to expand a little bit more on what uh, the institute that I had at Berkeley is up to and how we're tied into all of these discussions today um, and how we got uh, connected to the Volcker Alliance and the work we've been doing with them. Um, so. Just in terms of uh, our general mission, um, I think it's a pretty unique one, and I think um, it's at the sort of confluence of a lot of issues that I care about, and I think that the Goldman School does really well, and it's in particular looking at millennials, although we're not supposed to say millennials anymore um, because that apparently is a loaded term. We're supposed to say young Americans or young Californians. Uh, so that is primarily our, our, our focus area. Um, and we're really concerned with uh, you know, something we're calling political and policy demography. So you know, how does age interact with politics and policy? Um, so just as an example, some of the kinds of questions that we're interested uh, in answering, um, you know, how, how do we adequately invest in the next generation of young people? Um, whether that's K through 12 or higher ed, um, looking at how uh, we're actually um, investing in things like infrastructure or not investing. Um, and then also, how do we do that at the same time that we take care of an aging population, um, you know, make sure that retirement is rewarding? Um, and how do we do that while, you know, the number of retirees is going up and healthcare costs are exploding? It's a really um, pretty challenging question. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we also have some interesting things with this particular group of young people coming up. They're more diverse. Um, they're the more, most diverse generation in history. Uh, they're the most educated. Uh, I think finally in the last year or so, uh, young people took over uh, in terms of the largest voting bloc in the country, although they don't tend to vote at the, the same rates as older folks, and that's maybe a topic for another presentation. Um, but again, we're interested in, you know, if young people aren't the ones showing up to vote, um, are their interests being well represented? And are these kinds of investments that would benefit young people actually being made? Um, so we're really concerned in, you know, how, how can we do the best by everybody? And it's a tricky, um, a tricky question to try and answer, um, and there are a lot of trade-offs. So just to kind of zoom out for a second, um, we, the center was, or the institute was founded uh, uh, looking uh, at this big idea of what's going on with entitlement programs at a federal level and really being concerned uh, looking at uh, the expansion of entitlement programs like uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and what that's doing to the federal budget. Um, in particular, what that might mean uh, in terms of these investments in young people. Um, again, these are just projections. This is CBO data. It's a little old, but um, just shows you that you know these these programs are expected to expand quite substantially over the next uh, you know 60 years or so, um, and eventually would be make up about a quarter of GDP, um, which is a huge expansion. Um, that in and of itself wouldn't necessarily be all that concerning, except at the same time. Um, we have all of these demographic shifts happening. Um, we know that fertility rates are declining. Um, uh, the boomer population is just hitting retirement now. Uh, and so if we look actually uh, here at the, um, the ratio of sort of working age population to uh, those 65 and older, you can see that in the 1980s we're at about you know, a five, five to one ratio. Uh, and now projected out into 2060, I mean, that's, that's really coming down quite a bit um, to about two and a half workers for every retired person. So, um, you know, that, that's, you know, fewer people to kind of support this, this uh, aging population. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, the center's been doing a little bit of work just to look at some of these trends over time. And this next graph, um, this is uh, current population survey data. Uh, I had a grad student working for me last semester, um, James Hawkins, who pulled this together. He was basically interested, and I hope you can see it on this screen. This is just a breakout of income um, from different sources. And so uh, I won't go into all of these categories, but that blue at the top is wage earnings. Um, and then you can see government support like Social Security, um, other retirements, other government support. And so uh, 
you can see that uh, we start on the far left, that's the 18 to 24 year olds, those are sort of the young, young millennials, uh, all the way up to 65 and older. And so if we look from the 60s on up to current, uh, present day, um, it's been pretty flat for young people. Um, the economic gains that we've seen um, for other age groups have not uh, been realized at that young age. Um, and that primarily, if you look in these older age groups, that uh, increase is being driven quite substantially by things like Social Security. Um, so uh, this, again, is just some, a trend that we're trying to highlight and point out um, and also study uh, you know, what kinds of investments should we be making, what's happening with this younger population. Um, so I also want to clarify, too, um, these entitlement programs uh, have been uh, wildly successful, and they have brought down the elderly poverty rate in this country um, quite substantially since the 60s. I mean, they've been incredibly successful. Um, but what we also are trying to point out is that uh, child poverty in this country has been pretty flat over that same time period. Um, and so, you know, I think we as a country have decided that we are going to make investments um, in an older population, that we want to live a retirement that is fulfilling, but I think over time uh, we are not making that same kind of investment uh, in young people coming up and just starting out. Uh, and so that's something we want to examine. And then lastly, I just kind of wanted to highlight what, what happened uh, uh, in this most recent recession in 2008. Um, so uh, this again is broken out by age group, that top uh, blue line is these young millennials, 18 to 24. They, on average, have higher unemployment rates uh, than other age groups, which makes sense. Um, but they also tend to be, be more hard hit by uh, recessions. So you can see that uh, their unemployment rate uh, skyrocketed up to about 18% there uh, in the two years following uh, the 2008 recession. And then uh, in terms of their recovery, they're a little bit slower um, to, to recover from that recession. And actually, in present day, I think this goes up to 2016, their unemployment rate is still hovering around 10%, which actually was sort of the national average at the height of the recession. Um, so young people are really struggling. And I think um, you know, everyone probably has their own story of kids or grandkids you know, living in, back in their homes and that kind of thing. And so um, I think there's quite a bit um, that we could kind of tease out of what's going on here. Um, and you know, we have some data that we've been pulling out, and I won't go into it here. Um, but, you know, I think also the labor market is changing, right, as these young people are beginning to enter it. And so they're having to grapple with uh, changes on that end as well. Um, so this brings me to back to uh, kind of what Bill touched on in our partnership with the Volcker Alliance, uh, which is to say um, we have a sense that young people are maybe struggling. Um, we're trying to tease out kind of what some of the causal factors behind that might be, um, whether or not it's, you know, declining uh, public investment in things like uh, K through 12 and higher education, or whether there are some other underlying factors uh, that are going on in the economy, uh, likely both. Um, but to that end, to the degree to which we're making trade-offs uh, in these state budgets at a local level, um, we want to be able to see how states are making these choices. Um, and so that leads us to this work with, um, with the Volcker Alliance, uh, looking at transparency and state budgeting. Um, I think there are certain areas of this project that in particular were fairly directly related to some of the Institute's work, in particular the area of pensions, uh, where again, you know, we're trying, and I'll, I'll touch on this in a bit, um, we have some new work around uh, uh, the pension issue. Um, you know, we're looking at things like what are the trade-offs in spending on long-term investments versus, you know, current services. Bill touched on this a little bit, but from a political standpoint, it's very hard to overcome some of this um, sort of more myopic behavior, but it's much easier um, to kind of make uh, short-term decisions as a politician, much more difficult to have the leadership uh, to really be thinking long-term about the kinds of investments uh, we should be making. And to that end, when you look at things like pension debt, um, fairly easy to push that off onto future generations especially when young people aren't necessarily in the rooms these decisions are being made in. Um, so uh, I'll bring back up just uh, Bill's slide very briefly. So uh, the Berkeley team contributed to these, uh, this analysis of, or the data collection for these Western states except for Alaska here. Um, I will say we're going to get into this on the next two panels, but um, you know, obviously legacy costs is kind of the one big area that's been uh, California was sort of dinged for here and, you know, but still is doing better than some states out there. Um, 
But also, I think California actually came out looking pretty good in this analysis. Um, and I think if you look at the years um, the data was collected, the state was doing quite well in terms of um, its revenue growth. And so um, things like sort of one-time maneuvers, um, uh, you know, those types of things weren't necessarily an issue because the state had, had pretty uh, full coffers. Um, so I wanted to uh, shift briefly to some new research coming out of the Institute. Uh, Sarah, Professor Sarah Anzia couldn't be here today, but I wanted to mention a new paper that she's been working on. And I think on our second panel today, um, we'll get into a little bit more about how um, local governments are faring given what's going on with state pensions. Um, so uh, I encourage you all to go uh, find this paper following it. I'll have a link up here at the end. But um, Professor Anzia uh, has a new paper out uh, called Pensions in the Trenches Are Rising City Pension Costs Crowding Out Public uh, Services. Um, and I think this is a pretty uh, unique and interesting uh, new paper. Um, so a lot of existing research, I think, just to back up, I think that there's some sense in the media that uh, states and cities are struggling with rising uh, pension costs. Um, I, I think less is known sort of on a comprehensive level about, you know, is this just a few cities or is this something that's actually affecting uh, cities across the board and what's, what's driving that? Um, and so I think what was unique about the work that Professor Anzia did was that she actually put together a new data set um, she actually has annual pension expenditures uh, from 219 municipal governments from across the country, which she um, uh, sort of sampled to, to, to pick, up, pick those country, or pick those cities, sorry. Um, and she basically was able to collect data from the city's CAFRs on uh, pension obligations, um, employment, uh, and then also expen uh, um, expenditures. Um, and so, what she found was that, so this is actually looking at uh, pension expenditures themselves. So it's what cities were spending, not what cities were obligated to spend. Um, and so I think that's actually the more relevant question when you're looking at whether or not other uh, services uh, at a local level are being squeezed out. Um, and what she found is that you know, pensions are rising everywhere. Um, on average, if you look um, at inflation-adjusted pension expenditures, you're looking at about a 69% increase between 2005 and 2014. Um, and in about a quarter of the cities that she analyzed, uh, pension expenditures have actually more than doubled. Um, that said, there's a lot of variation across these 219 cities. Um, you know, she found that large urban areas and cities that have um, collective bargaining laws actually spent much more per employee. Um, and that was, uh, you know, smaller. Uh, that was, you know, more than in smaller, more rural areas. Um, and I can just show you one of her um, charts here. This, if you just go row by row, um, you kind of go smallest cities to to largest cities. And these are just pulling out some examples. Um, and I see you can see that it, there is some variation over time. Um, I think so. Like one example, if you look at Dallas, Texas, in this last row, it's the third one. From the right, um, one piece of the analysis was a little bit tricky, and I think something that Chuck already touched on was um, if cities issued pension obligation bonds, that would show up as a really large expenditure, obviously, in one year, and then it would look like they had decreased um, their spending in subsequent years. Um, so that was sort of one uh, potential issue with the data that was hard to tease out just based on you know CAFRs and other financial documents that she had. Um, the other thing is, like, if you look at Chicago, which is the far uh, bottom and the far right, um, obviously, if cities are struggling, um, they actually, you would find that some of them, like Chicago, would actually decrease their pension expenditures over time. Um, so it's not really, um, in terms of just looking at pension, pension expenditures, um, it doesn't, you can't really tease out from this, like, how well are cities doing um, because of some of those issues. So um, what she was trying to tease out, given these 219 cities, was actually, can you figure out um, to what degree cities are actually decreasing, uh, increasing, you know, what effect it has had on uh, cities' employment, and then also uh, what effect it's had on other expenditures at the city level. And this, I think, is, again, another way in which the research is directly tied into what the Institute is concerned about, is that if you're a young person living in Chicago and suddenly, you know, city is cutting expenditures on services that matter to you or is no longer hiring at the same rates, I mean, those are very real things that would affect um, your daily life. 
Um, so actually she found, her main finding in the paper was that a 10% increase in per employee pension expenditures was as associated with a 0.73 average drop in city employment um, over that time period that she studied, or over the, in the following year, I should say. Um, and then again, she found that there were some uh, differences across the type of city that you were looking at. So, um, you know, the, these types of employment reductions were actually most pronounced um, for non-public safety employees and for cities in states with collective bargaining uh, laws. Um, and then she also found that um, uh, that uh, sorry that actually, in addition to reducing employment, cities were also more likely to cut uh, spending on capital and equipment. Um, so again, pretty real um, uh, sort of uh, budgetary implications uh, for some of these cities. Um, so I know I'm just kind of touching on uh, some of this research. It was partially funded by the Berkeley Institute for the Future of Young Americans, which is why I wanted to present uh, it today. But if you want to know more, I encourage you to go find uh, Professor Anzia's profile on the Goldman uh, website. She has a lot more there. Um, and this is just part of a working paper that, that she's been uh, working on. And with that, we can take questions if there are any. Hi, Mark Jaffe from the Reason Foundation. Hi. I was really interested that you started on the federal side. Um, last week, the federal government put out its own version of its CAFR the uh, audited financial statements of the uh, federal government, and it showed a negative net position of uh, $20 billion, um, and that didn't include $49 billion of unfunded Medicare and Social Security obligations. So I'm wondering, you, do you think that um, it might be possible to take uh, the tool set that the Volcker Alliance and the affiliated universities are doing and apply it to the federal government as well? I've got a question for you. Uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> boy, uh, boy. It, it, I don't know, honestly, it, it's, um, cause I, I, I don't know enough about federal accounting. Um, the fact that the federal government has no capital budget, uh, it is itself, it, itself would be an issue in, in doing this type of evaluation. Uh, everything is, everything is done by appropriate annual appropriation. Uh, and the, the, the fact that realistically the federal government doesn't have a budget is, is also a disincentive. The, the federal government has spending plans and funding plans, and they last for, uh, they last for days, weeks, months. Um, side deals like, uh, uh, like the sequester, um, Simpson Bowles. So what is, I'm not sure what the federal budget is anymore. Uh, to, to do this type of analysis. And, and you're right on uh, looking at a financial statement. Social Security is, is, in, a, is in a trust fund. Um, it's, related to the, it's related to the budget, but it's often its own, it, it's often its own world. Uh, it's interesting that I think the only federal agency that, um, that requires uh, full pre-funding of pensions is the Postal Service. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and simply because Congress can do that. So I, I, I would be, uh, I think a lot, of these, a lot of these principles apply to the federal government. I, 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 I would, uh, I'd need a lot, of, a lot of time and money to take it on. <laughs> uh, seeing no more questions in the, uh, in the room, would you like to, should we move on to, uh, Sure, we to can. our next panel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, let's move on to unit two.